You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. You can make this possible. You talked about uh, whiteness. Well, the reality is uh, that is really the subject of a new book uh, that we talk about next in our book club. White evangelicals play a powerful role in the disunion of today's American political scene uh, and also the role they have in the Republican Party. Dr. Anthea Butler, she's the author of a new book. It is called White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. And she joins us uh, right now. This is the book right here. Again, uh, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America. Dr. Butler, glad to have you on here. And, and the reality is this here, we see it constantly. We saw it with Donald Trump, uh, how they sucked up to him. Uh, the racist things that he said, they didn't care. Xenophobic things, whatever, don't care. The attack on Muslims, don't care. Uh, and that these white evangelicals, these white conservative evangelicals, uh, it's more about white is it is about Jesus. That is absolutely correct, Roland. Thank you for having me tonight. I, I wanted to show this as a history in this book because I think it's really important for everyone in America to understand that evangelicalism, the foundation, has been racism since the 19th century and even before that, but especially for the 19th to the 21st century. And the ways in which they've used morality to shield the kind of power that they want and the ways that they have placed themselves within the Republican Party, I think is important for where we have been and where we're about to go in this country right now. And, and the reality is, uh, i give a perfect example. Um, you have um, Ralph Reed. He has his uh, faith and freedom or freedom and faith, whatever the hell they call it, um, annual deal. And uh, there have been a number of times I've gone on his uh, list, and it's all of these Republican candidates come through, all these Republican speakers. And uh, I've often tweeted them saying, boy, I noticed, I said, for a so-called faith conference, y'all ain't got one session on poverty or any of the stuff Jesus talked about. Uh, and, what, and, and, it's, and it's amazing how their business interests are their business interests, their interests on all these other issues, and it's not about faith, but they use they use that Bible to bludgeon others when it comes to the culture wars. No, that's absolutely correct. I mean, because the number one thing is about how do you get the power and how do you get the money. I mean, I think one of the things that people need to understand is that all this time when evangelicals were talking about abortion, they were talking about same-sex marriage, they were talking about all these things that they detested and the kind of morality they wanted, I think one of the things that was really interesting from 2016 forward is that Donald Trump blew all that up and let everybody else see it. Some of us knew that before. But when you're talking about going to meetings with Ralph Reed, I mean, Ralph Reed had this had this all down back in the 90s. Before it was Faith and Freedom, it was Christian Coalition. And they started that off with them to tell people how they were supposed to vote, how they needed to think about the candidates. So they even had voters, guys, that you could take into the voting booth and vote just straight down the ticket like they wanted you to. So I think one of the things that we need to see about what evangelicals have been doing is this way in which they've ingratiated themselves politically, you know, first, if we're talking about the 19th century Democratic Party, and then in the 20th century, post-1964, um, where that has gone into the Republican Party and this marriage of sorts that they have had with each other. Um, and, and when we talk about, again, we, when, when you look at how they, how they weaponize uh, faith, uh, it, it's amazing how silent they are on issues of racial justice, uh, because again, whiteness precedes their faith. Yes, that is correct. And I think, you know, again, we have to see this from both the historical and the current perspective, the ways in which they talk about the family, for instance. Remember all the talk about the black family is broken. They don't have any parents. It's always about, you know, whether or not somebody is, um, you know, unwed mothers and things like this, and they put this on the black family. These are constructions that were made in the 19th century, but they have an effect in the 21st century because that's when they say, well, we're not going to give anybody any help. We're not going to do anything about schools. We're not going to do anything about any of these things that people are really, you know, really serious and need to think about. So what evangelicals have been doing is sort of doing like a bait and switch. They've been talking about morality all this time, but the reality is, is that they've been pulling away the kinds of social contracts that we need or even the things that you think about that are in the gospel that they should believe about feeding the poor, you know, taking care of the, the widows and all this other stuff. They haven't done any of this at all. This is all about, about power and about how they can have more power, A, and B, more money. 
Questions from my panel. I'll start first off with uh, Avis. You know, I find this to be a very intriguing topic because, you know, I may not be the best uh, expert on religion, but it seems very clear to me uh, that when you look at white evangelicals and how they behave versus what Christianity supposedly stands for, I'm so excited that your work is exposing it for what it is, being based in protecting whiteness versus Christianity. So my question to you is, in terms of being able to empower um, sort of... Uh, Christians beyond that specific ilk to maybe call them to task, you know, do you think that there is anything that, that other people could do who are maybe interested in perhaps um, showing the, a more strong fidelity to the, to the morality and to the standards of Christianity uh, to really call out these white evangelicals uh, as the, the, once again, the hypocrites that they are? are? Are there, you know, I'm thinking of Reverend Barber perhaps as an example, but other examples of how individuals who are more true to faith, uh, what they should do to call out this, this sort of strong voting block that really stands for nothing more than um, weaponizing their racism in the political sphere. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think one of the things you first have to do is if you are in any of these churches, you need to get up and go because basically you're subjecting yourself to this kind of thinking. And I think for a lot of black conservatives, especially, they have bought this hook, line and sinker. And that means that they are projecting this out into our black communities is one thing. Second, I think about pastors, not just about Reverend Barber, but, you know, Reverend Otis Moss, you know, Reverend Freddie Haynes and others who are preaching what I would call a more full gospel. And in terms of thinking about social justice, the kind of race issues. The other thing I think is really important is I think that black Christians need to stop playing these racial reconciliation games with white, with white evangelicals. I, I'm looking at right now what's happening with the Southern Baptist Convention and how they're having black pastors leaving like the white McKissick and others because they finally figured out that they had enough. What they didn't understand before is that they were pawns in this game of making those people look like they were less racist than they really are. And I think that's the other thing we have to call out is that the kinds of people who continue to support these white racist structures by saying we don't see color are in fact, you know, messing up their black brothers and sisters because, and as a matter of fact, the color that they see, just as long as, just as much as white evangelicals, is white. And that's the important part. I want to say one more thing, though. I think what's really important is that, you know, black churches know how to get out the vote. And right now, voting is in peril. And evangelicals are a part of this. There's a whole history about that with somebody named Paul Ryrick, who in the 1970s was working alongside at the beginnings of the moral majority with people like Jerry Falwell Sr. and others. One of the things he said was this, we don't want everybody to vote. You all think that there's supposed to be good government, but we don't want everybody to vote. And we need to figure out how to make sure that these people don't vote. These people mean black people. And so black churches need to do more than just get souls out to the polls. We need to get involved in every area of po political action and activity and begin to do the same kinds of things that white evangelicals have been doing. Mm. Julian. Your work, my sister, is very powerful, as is your presentation, and we're grateful for you, especially when I think about the letter from the Brim Birmingham jail where Dr. King called out the white Christians who basically could not deal with racism. And so you're basically talking about some of the same things, these folks who refuse to deal with their own racism. I'm glad you ended your comment uh, from Avis with the commentary about voting and the polls. But what about the economic aspects, aspect, aspects of this? What can we do economically to bring these fundamentalist Christians to their knees, to make them think well, different about us. Yes, this is this is a little bit harder. And I, I need to say this because I think this is really important for your listeners to understand and for black Christians especially to understand. These organizations like Focus on the Family, Family Research Council, American Family Association, these are not just about talking about nice Christian things. These are powerful lobbying organizations that back up Republicans. Where are our powerful lobbying organizations? We have not given money in the same way to these kinds of things, first of all. And secondarily, we rely on the NAACP and other kinds of orgs to do that work. We need to start to think about how do we get 
organizations that are fighting for the things that we want. One of the things that people said, you know, and various administrations, I'm not going to pick on anybody right now, is that black people bring out the votes for you, but we don't get the things that we want. And I think that one of the reasons why is because we have to have a concerted organization about how we do that and how to put the pressure on lawmakers and others and people in your own community. Right now, people in my home state of Texas are fighting about voting right now. They're trying to get this thing so that they don't lock down things like they've locked it down in Georgia. And I think that's where we need to start to train our energies and that churches will have to think about how do they get involved because th this is disenfranchising black people. This is a way in which we're not being able to go to move forward. One more thing. I think a lot of times what we don't even consider are the ways in which white evangelicals are embedded in law enforcement and how that works out, this whole Blue Lives Matter thing, the ways in which, you know, um, you know, uh, the police get sacralized, this organization that was raising money for that boy in Wisconsin that went and shot two people after the police shooting, that's a Christian organ, white Christian organization raising almost a million dollars for a kid who went with a gun and shot people indiscriminately. Now, I ask you, how do we get through all of this? Well, one thing we have to do is to begin to realize that these organizations are there and that, again, if you are a black person, stop giving money to this and start to think about the ways in which you can empower organizations that are fighting for the rights of people in a much more broad way than just these narrow ways that you have been. Because I think a lot of people out there are giving their 10% to white churches and white leaders that don't need their money. Eugene. I appreciate you being here. You kind of answered my question with your last answer. But I guess um, to me, reframe it a little bit. Um, with the blackening and browning of America, um, I would presume the same is going to happen within the Christian community. Um, you know, what were some of the tactics that maybe some of the organizations can, can take to prepare for that, um, to assume those mantles of power and those mantles of influence? Um, you know, as the blackening and browning happens, um, the power of white evangelical is either going to it's, it's going to either be super compact and limited to certain regional areas, uh, or just be diluted altogether. And um, you know, Black America needs to be prepared to, to step into that fold and uh, assume that, that and fill that power gap. Well, you would think that, but when you have people who have a stranglehold on power, that's going to be a little bit more difficult because. Well, you say that, you know, black and brown people will be able to get that. I want to remind you that during the Trump administration, we had over 200 judges appointed, you know, and then you also had three Supreme Court judges appointed. So this is not a game. This is really serious in the ways in which the people will have to think strategically about maybe the demographics are changing, but how do you change the power structure? The power structure cannot change unless we have people at every level of government. We begin to have different kinds of people at every level of government. So what I mean by that is people who are willing to think about the ways in which power has been used in, mal in malfeasance kind of ways. And to think about how we're going to prepare for that is to think about, are our organizations strong enough? That's first of all. Are we linking up with churches to think about that? How do we think about getting equal pay for everybody? You were just talking about Kroger. It is a shame that Kroger is doing what it's doing right now, and there's no excuse for it. It's just none, because they make millions and millions of dollars. But at the same time, I think economic pressure is really important. There is a question about you know, whether or not people should be boycotting Georgia. And there was questions that Stacey Abrams didn't want that, and other people wanted boycotts of certain things that happened in Georgia. I think people have to use the power that they have at hand to start to make these organizations pay attention to things. But until we decide to make a concerted effort like Republicans and evangelicals have together to be involved in the political system and not just getting elected, but also making the structures underneath those elections, you know, to, to hold firm, I think that's really important. Last thing, now this is going to be the thing that hurts everybody's feelings. I think that many of these churches and religious organizations in this country probably need to pay taxes because they've gotten away with this for a very long time. We see all the stories. There was just a story today about a pastor, I believe, somewhere in the D.C. area that got 1.5 million PPP money and just used that to buy a bunch of cars. <coughs> Excuse me. This is ridiculous. And I think that it's not just the ways in which people take money from the government, but it's also the ways they, they fleece people in order to buy jets and all this kind of stuff. And we joke about that. 
But there's a real serious part of this where evangelical Christianity has turned into a real business, and we need to start considering it that, and we need to start taxing it. All right, then. All right, folks, uh, here's the book again. Show it, please. Um, the book is called uh, White Evangelical Racism, The Politics of Morality in America by Dr. An uh, uh, Anthea Butler. We appreciate it. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Take care. Thank you, Ron. All right. Thank you very much. All right, folks. Back to our Roll Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.